Hello, my name is Dr. Adam Shirakovsky and I'm a research analyst at COSEC Kadari Securities. Today I'll be talking about the price to book value return on equity model, a model to estimate the fair value of a company share. Firstly, I will give a short historical introduction with reference to other models, and then I will formally introduce the model. The model is used to evaluate four companies, and finally, I will end up by looking at benefits and shortcoming of the price to book value return on equity model. Just a friendly reminder that COSEC does not take into account the investment objective, financial situation and advisory needs of any particular person, nor does the information provided constitute investment advice. For more information, visit COSEC.com.au. Okay, so with that, let's get started. So the price to book value return on equity model goes back to the 80s, where it was introduced by Professor Wilcox and published in Financial Analyst Journal in 1984. You can see here he's promoting the model, saying it outperforms other price to earning models. More recent research have considered more complex variants of the model, but here we will look at the original model. Before looking at the formula, I just wanted to relate the model to other stock valuation models. The diagram here shows the most frequently used models according to a survey conducted in 2019. And we can see that the price to book value return on equity model is the third most frequently used after the discounted cash flow model and the market approach. Let us now look at the model. I will get to the meaning of each of the terms, but let me just read the formula. So the intrinsic value of a share is computed by taking the book value per share and multiplying it by a fraction, where at the top you have the return on equity minus the sustainable growth rate, and at the bottom you have the required rate of return minus the sustainable growth rate. So to explain all the terms, firstly, I will need to talk about equity. So a company can raise capital in two ways. Firstly, it can borrow capital from creditors like banks, and that is called liability. Secondly, it can raise capital from shareholders, and that is called equity. In summary, we have the balance sheet formula displaying at the bottom right, saying that the value of a company's assets equals to equity and liabilities. So in broad terms, you can think about equity as money shareholders lend to the company. With that, we can now explain Rho, or return on equity. So for example, if a company generates $100,000 in profits in a year, and it has $1 million in equity, then Rho is 10%. The 10% is simply return divided by equity. So that is also why it's called return on equity. Now in regards to the book value, usually book value is defined as assets minus intangible assets minus liabilities. But in practice, the intangible assets are often ignored and the equity and book value are the same thing. So for example, if a company has 100,000 shares outstanding and $1 million in equity, then the book value of a share is $10. PO stands for payout ratio and represents the proportion of income that the company pays out to its shareholders. So for example, if a company generates $100,000 in profits in a year and pays out $60,000 in dividends to shareholders, then the payout ratio is 60%. Then we have the required rate of return. So the required rate of return is the minimum amount of profits an investor will require before he or she is willing to invest in a particular asset class. So for example, if you go to a bank and you put your money there, then you will be expecting a rate of return of let's say 1%. That is rather low because there is very little risk involved. The same applies to stocks. To be willing to buy shares, you will require an even higher rate of return because the investment is riskier. Simply put, higher risk and higher reward. While there are formulas to estimate a required rate of return, these formulas have one big shortcoming. They cannot take into account an investor's own risk appetite. And that is certainly nothing wrong in using your own risk appetite to help you determine a suitable required rate of return. So remember this, a higher required rate of return will make companies look less valuable, less attractive. Hence, you will be less likely to buy them. In contrast to this, a lower required rate of return will boost the results, making companies look better and encourage you to buy more. In this presentation, 
we will be using required rate of return at 6.42%. Finally, let's have a look at the last term, the sustainable growth rate. The formula is as you can see, but more formally, the sustainable growth rate is the maximum rate of growth that a company can sustain without needing to raise more capital. In particular, if there are no dividends being paid, then the growth rate equals to rho, the return on equity. Now let's look at examples. Firstly, we'll be looking at the mining company, BHP. We start by deciding what the book value per share should be. So to do this, we are looking at the data from the last four years. We can see those numbers at the table to the left. On the right, we also plotted this as a function of time. We see that the book value is downtrending. However, there is still fluctuations up and down. To be on the safe side, we use linear regression to get the value for 2020. This is simply plotting the best straight line fit and read off the value at 2020. So we see the line reaches about 13.50. Let us now look at return on equity. Again, we are looking at the last four years. Here we will keep things simple and just take the average over the last four years. That gives 14.3%. Now let's look at estimating PO or payout ratio. So what we do, we take all the dividends from the last four years and divide by the sum of all the earnings of the last four years. This accidentally turns out to be 100.0%. So here we see that the company has paid out all of its earning over the last four years. While 100% is very high, mining companies typically give out quite a bit of their earnings to their shareholders. Having computed the return on equity and the payout ratio, we can now compute the sustainable growth rate. As you can see, that becomes zero. This is because PO equals to one, so the second term in the formula is zero making the entire product zero as well. As mentioned before, I have set the required rate of return to be 6.42%. Here we have a summary of all of our computations. We have used linear regression to get a 13.57, and then the last four years, and a simple average to get a return on equity of 14.3%. Then we looked at a four-year total of dividends and earnings to get a payout ratio of 100%. And that gave us a G, the sustainable growth rate of zero. Combining all of these values gives an intrinsic value for the company of $13.13. The price of BHP at this point is above 50. So at least this computation suggests as BHP is overvalued. That being said, the price to earning ratio of 100% or G equals to zero is definitely not realistic long term. If G was a bit higher, that would have boosted the estimate, giving something more realistic. We do not want G to be zero. That is certainly something to keep in mind. Here I just listed all of what we have seen, but done in Excel. So this table is actually directly linked to Excel. So all the values in the darker fields are numbers I provided, and then the rest was computed by Excel. The part that is perhaps worth mentioning at this point is how I got 13.57 using linear regression. So you simply find the slope and then the y-intercept for the best fit of a straight line, and then you use that to get the 13.57. Okay, so the next company is CSL, and here we have an estimate of about minus 20. So that is definitely not correct, and there is something wrong. Looking at the numbers, we see that the problem is G. It's really just very, very big. And that means that R minus G becomes negative, and the entire result becomes negative as well. So in this case, where G is very large, the price to book value return on equity model does not work. We want G to be below R. That is something to keep in mind. The next company is Macquarie Group, ticker code MQG. Here, the intrinsic value of MQG is estimated to be 1,481. That is more than nine times the current share price. While the value of G is not zero and it's not larger than R, there is something else wrong. Here, the issue is that the value of R and the value of G are very close to one another. 
So the difference r minus g becomes very small. And when you divide by a very small number, then the result becomes very big. We do not want g and r to be close to one another. That is also something to keep in mind. Finally, we have Telstra. This time, g is not zero, g is not larger than r, and g and r are not close to one another. So all of the problems we have seen before are not present here. As a result, we see that the valuation is actually very accurate. This computation estimates the share price to be $3.96, just slightly above the current share price of $3.74. Let us now discuss some of the benefits and limitations of the price to book value return on equity model. So broadly speaking, but this also aligns very well what we have seen just so far, the model works best for companies with a moderate return on equity and solid dividends. This ensures that the sustainable growth rate fits well into the model. In terms of shortcomings, one issue is that the model is quite sensitive to changes in book value. If book value doubles, then the estimate doubles as well. More seriously, the model assigns the intrinsic value of zero if the company does not pay dividends. So let me explain this in a bit more detail. If there are no dividends, then of course the payout ratio is zero. But that means that g equals to rho, and hence rho minus g becomes zero. And if that's the case, then the second term in the formula for the intrinsic value becomes zero, making the entire formula zero as well. So this is how we see that if there is no dividends being paid, then the intrinsic value of the company becomes zero. And that is certainly a very serious shortcoming of this model. In summary, after a small introduction, I formally introduced the price to book value return on equity model. After that, the model was used to estimate the share price of BHP, CSL, MQG, and TLS. Finally, I finish up with a brief discussion about the applicability of the model. In conclusion, while there are some restrictions of when the model can be used, for example, in relation to the sustainability growth rate, the model certainly is a valuable additional tool to help investors make more informed financial decisions. My name is Dr. Adam Shirokovsky, and this presentation was brought to you by Kozak Kadari Securities.